Now, part of me feels sorry for this man in the parable. His master gives him one talent. This means a large sum of money, equivalent to many thousands of pounds. This man is not evil, he's not dishonest. He looks after the money very carefully, burying it in a secure place. And he gives it back to the master when he returns. He doesn't keep anything, he doesn't steal anything. But this man is condemned outright and thrown out into the darkness where there is weeping and grinding of teeth. It begs the question, what went wrong? Well, the key mistake is that he misunderstands the nature of this particular gift. Because each gift that we receive has its own meaning. Some gifts, for example, are meant to be consumed, like an apple or a McDonald's Big Mac. Some gifts are meant to be used, like a pen or a bicycle. Some gifts are meant to be treasured and admired, like the vintage Woody Allen film poster that hangs on the wall in my office. You can come and look afterwards and admire it with me. Or the photo of my mum and dad that sits on the bookshelf beside my desk. Do you see the different meanings of these gifts and the different responsibilities that come with them? If you start to eat your pen, I assume you're having an essay crisis. If you try to eat your bicycle, I worry that you are mentally ill. If you come back from McDonald's one evening and you hang your Big Mac on the wall, I don't know how you would do that, but anyway, if you do and you put a frame round it and you sit there admiring it, I'd think you were a little bit eccentric. And if you continued to put every meal for the next month onto the wall, I would be very, very worried about you indeed. The man in the parable misunderstands the nature of the gift he's received. He thinks this gift, this talent, is a gift to be treasured and guarded and protected. He treats it literally as buried treasure. And if it is just treasure, it's good to bury it. But no, instead, this is a gift that is meant to be used. It's like the pen, it's like the bicycle. And in this case, in this parable, it's meant to be traded and invested and exploited so that when the master returns, he can see a healthy profit. It's a gift that's meant to do something. This is true for each of us. Each one of you has been given certain gifts. And don't lose sight of the first line of the parable, that the master trusted his servants with his property. That's the first miracle, the first message, if you like, that God's, God trusts us. He trusts you with his gifts. It doesn't matter how big or small they seem. Do you notice in the parable how the servants are given different amounts of money, different quantities of talents, but the reward at the end for the two faithful servants is exactly the same. There is absolutely no point in comparing the different gifts that each of us has received. God alone knows why he gives one person this and another person that. The point is to use the gifts, whatever they are, and not to hide them or ignore them. They might be human gifts, your intelligence, your friendship, your time, your care. They might be spiritual gifts, the gift of prayer, of faith, of forgiveness, of intercession, of healing, of prophecy. The list might be long, it might be, it might feel as, as if it's very, very short. 
But with each gift, the secret, the key, the imperative is to use it, to take risks, to not, <coughs> pardon me, to not be afraid. And to keep everything in perspective. At the end of the parable, everything the servants have, everything they've made, is given back to their master because everything truly belongs to him. And this is true for us as well. Everything we do and possess belongs to God ultimately and we will give it back to him. This is not meant to make us afraid. No, it gives us a higher purpose, a deeper perspective. We all have ambitions especially you as young students, thinking about your studies now and what lies beyond them, maybe next year. You should indeed be ambitious, ambitious for what you can achieve for God and for others. And St Paul uses this word. He says that we should be ambitious for the higher gifts. Just make sure that your ambition has a higher purpose. Money and qualifications, power and status, these are not bad things in themselves, but nor are they ends in themselves. When you choose a particular job or a long-term career, try to choose something that is truly worthwhile. It doesn't mean that every Christian has to work in a charity or an NGO. It doesn't mean that there's something unworthy about working in business or banking or entertainment or engineering. But whatever you do, do it because you believe in it, because you know that it's something worthwhile and that even in some quiet, hidden way, you know that it can give glory to God and be a form of service to your neighbour. At the end of time, and at the end of our lives, God will ask us what we have done with the gifts he has entrusted to us. Our life with him in eternity will depend on our faithfulness to him in time, in this life. This is not about justifying ourselves by our achievements, our good works. No, it is about trying to be faithful to the mission that God has given to us. For those in the parable, and for you and me, it's faithfulness that counts.